Okay, everyone. So Slim Jim is here to talk about Doxus. I think I've seen Slim Jim. At, we've been at like 75 cons together or something like that. It's got to be pretty close to that. But now he, he always gives a great talk, and he's got a ton of information. And since he's with someone new, he has enhanced his presentation. So thank you, Scott. So my uh, official name is Brian Wilson. I want to talk today about uh, Doxus Networks. So basically, in case anybody doesn't know, what is a Doxus Network? That is the protocol that cable modems run on. So if you receive your broadband at home over a cable modem, you're on a Doxus Network. So this, is, this presentation is best done as interactive as possible. And since I have such a huge crowd, I expect a lot of questions. <clears throat> So I'm just going to sit down here and run through it. So here's the network architecture of a Doxus network. So the, the big black cloud there is the internet. It's connected to the service provider IP core network. This would be your ISP's network. It doesn't necessarily have to be in one city. Most major ISPs are co-located in, they are in many, many, many locations. They have private fiber networks, backbones, and they're able to be in multiple places at once. So your IP core or, uh, service provider network can in some ways be almost as big as the internet in some, in some cases, depending on what kind of provider you connect to. And they can actually transport you, your data packets, over their private network before they go to their peering networks. And in most cases, they're already peering with Google, Microsoft, most of your major Fortune 500 companies. So they have private links to these corporations. So when you click that link, you know, as you can get to this site quicker than that site, it's probably because they have a private peering arrangement. So ISPs normally have public peering and private peering. Private peering is better in some ways because their public peering is all traffic they'll send through their network. So other ISPs traffic and whatnot because the internet is basically multiple service providers connecting together. So the public side is usually a couple gig, the private side might be 100 gig. And then if you're co-locating with a major service provider like Google, YouTube, something like that, when you click to get that video, if your service provider is one of the top five or something like that, you may come, it may come a little quicker because they're actually caching or they're directly connected to that company. So the next thing we're looking at here, trying to get feedback, is the CMTS, Cable Modem Transmission System. This is the device, this is the, this is the device the cable modem talks to. Um, there's multiple vendors that make this piece of equipment. The top vendor being Cisco Systems. There's also uh, Aris, Motorola, Costa Systems. There was a few other players in the market, but it's a very niche market. And if you're not the top three, you're going to be starving. The cable modems talk to the CMTS. And if you notice, I've divided this network into core network, internet service provider. I was talking about the CMTS just now. That's more of the access network. And then you see this, the, all those little boxes that say CM. That stands for cable modem. The cable modem is the device at your house, as you probably already know. So the cable modem is talking to the CMTS over RF, radio frequency. It's not Ethernet. You plug into an Ethernet, but it's actually talking to that CMTS device um, over radio frequency. And it's not symmetrical bidirectional communication. So the slides are kind of reference. I'll just spew out things as I can. I had a different slide set when I worked with my last employer who was a Fortune 50. And I did generate the slides, but due to the, it being their intellectual knowledge, I went ahead and made a new deck. So, but, um, so your cable modem is actually talking on RF, radio frequency. The spectrum in which the cable modem talks is between five megahertz and one gigahertz. Now keep in mind, this is over coax, so it's kind of like a private network. It's not, ra it's not radio over the air. It's radio frequency over coax, 75 ohm coax. But it's not just coax in your house. So when it leaves your house, it goes to the tap, the tap to the main line pole, the hard line cable. It's on the telephone poles or buried in the ground. From there, once it gets to your neighborhood, it goes to what's called an HFC node, hyper fiber coaxial node. From there, it actually gets converted into fiber optics. From the fiber optics, it travels back to the cable corporation's head ends facility where they combine all their signals. And then at that point, it gets converted back into radio frequency into all the head and gear. Because back in the old days, it was all straight up RF cable from their facility to you. 
But now as you know, urban sprawl happens, people move further and further away from cities, the best way to feed those customers is to run fiber out to the neighborhood and then break it onto uh, RF frequency. So I'm gonna be skipping around a little bit here as I go through the slides. So what is DOCSIS? So DOCSIS stands for Data Over Cable Sys Service Interface Specification. DOCSIS was created by Cable Labs. Cable Labs is a nonprofit research and design. Um, basically, the industry, the, the MSOs or multiple service operators, cable companies, they didn't want proprietary equipment. But by this vendor, CMTS, and this vendor's modems, and I'm stuck with that vendor. It's all proprietary, it's not open, and it gets real expensive real quick. The technology and actual cable modem is hundreds of dollars worth of chipset. But it only cost, well, it cost your cable company probably about 40 bucks. It cost you about 100. The, re, the way to bring prices down was to make it a standard, RFC, IEEE standard. Well, the cable, the cable organizations came together, your top providers, and they funded a research and design custodium called Cable Labs. So anybody who wants to make equipment for the cable, the cable industry has to get Cable Labs certified. DOCSIS is the brainchild of Cable Labs. So basically in the way how it works is the vendors come out with awesome ideas, usually the top three vendors, and then they submit them to Cable Labs because they're members, they have to pay to be members. Once it gets accepted in Cable Labs, all Cable Lab members have access to that intellectual knowledge to design that product or something similar. The firmware might be different, but the standard's the same. What that ends up doing is that drives cost down. The cost of the CMTS and the cost of the modem come way down. So in the early 90s, when you bought a cable modem, those things were like 500 bucks. Now they're a lot cheaper. Even the new DOCSIS 3.0 modems, you could go to Best Buy and pick one up for about 100 bucks. If you knew how much silicone was in that thing, how much processing power, you'd be amazed at how cheap it is. So, Cable Labs was good. Cable Labs helped the, uh, the industry, the cable industry, bring costs down and standardize on a centralized product that would be compatible across multiple vendors, which is always important to have open standards. So, basically, DOCSIS defines the interface specifications needed to basically speak the protocol in a bi-directional RF network. It's a lot deeper than that. That's kind of an overlay. The DOCSIS 1.0, the first version of DOCSIS protocol, is like 900 pages. DOCSIS 1.1, the brainchild follow-up of DOCSIS 1.0, almost doubled that. DOCSIS 2.0 tripled that, and DOCSIS 3.0 is just getting insane in size. So there's a lot of, it, it's, not some, it's not easy reading. <laughs> it's very dry, it's very technical, but it has, but it's good to be a standard. That way everybody can follow it. And of course, at any point during this, quote unquote talk, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, let me know. So current, uh, the current versions of DOCSIS. So the first version was 1.1. So some of the key characteristics of DOCSIS 1.0. DOCSIS 1.0 had no class of service, no QOS. Everything was considered best effort, didn't matter. As the cable industry wanted to provide voice services, they had to have a quality of service. Voice first, data second. That's where DOCSIS 1.1 comes into play. DOCSIS 1.1 created quality of service. On top of that, it also created Baseline Privacy Interface Plus. It's an encryption of your data so your neighbor can't sniff your information. DOCSIS 1.0 had BPI, which encrypted. BPI Plus encrypted and then also added X509 certificates and certificate of authority embedded inside the device. So you couldn't spoof or clone the devices as easily. <coughs> DOCSIS 2.0, um, the only major upgrade with DOCSIS 2.0 is it did, it did some minor IP version 6 support, but it also supported higher order modulations in the upstream. We'll get to that here shortly, and it'll make a little more sense when I get there. And then the latest and greatest flavor is DOCSIS 3.0. DOCSIS 3.0 basically takes everything we learned in DOCSIS 1.0, 1.1, and 2.0 and makes it sexier. So instead of using one downstream frequency, six megahertz block of RF spectrum, capable of about 36 megabits per second, we're now able to do what's called channel bonding. So think of RAID with hard drives or striping. Well, now we can stripe multiple downstream carriers to make one big pipe. We can combine, the, really honestly, the sky's the limit. The largest bonded chipset modem that I've seen out there today 
regularly available is eight, eight downstream channels, but I have seen uh, experimental 16 downstream channels where you can get over a gig a bit per second at the home. So it's, it is a direct competitor to fiber, but there is limited spectrum between the downstream being towards you from the cable provider, what your download is, is normally between 88 and up to one gigahertz. Well, each DOCSIS downstream carrier or video channel, because it's all MPEG-2 encoded, is six megahertz frequency block. So there's only so many slices of six you can stack between 88 and one gig, but there's a lot there. And when the FCC took away analog, that allows the cable corporations to come back and reclaim 88 to 500 megahertz, or 550, which is a large portion of spectrum. So just to kind of go back a little old school on you, a single analog video channel takes up six megahertz of RF spectrum. If I converted that to digital, I could hit 10 digital channels in six megahertz versus one analog channel because it's just that messy and wasteful. Probably three to four high definition channels at high, bit, high bandwidth or high action figure. So when it comes to video, it is actually still data. So if it's something like C-SPAN where it's not a lot of movement, it takes up a lot less megahertz per second on that spectrum than a high-speed action movie with cars moving around and stuff. Because every time there's a movement in pixelation, there's a new signal that has to come through. So a 6 megahertz block, which is the average size, Annex B in North America, and European is 8 megahertz. And DOCSIS, there's Euro DOCSIS, there's Japan DOCSIS, and then there's DOCSIS. Um, so a 6 megahertz channel is going to give you about 36.4 megabits usable data, 38 megabits raw. So think of having 16 of those strapped together at your leisure. Things are looking good. There's a lot of bandwidth there. The only problem is in the cable industry, there is you have to provide the video services, and there's the whole analog thing, the cable company versus the satellite. You don't need a digital box in every room. That's because they're pushing it over analog. So your old TV can still pick up the 72 channels on basic cable. Once they take that away and they reclaim that bandwidth, that's 72 possible 36 megabits downstreams available. Now, not everything's going to be data. But over our data carriers, we also carry VoIP, which is the phone service we provide, you know, the cable companies. And then there's also something called VDOC, Video Over Doxis. It's kind of a sexy new thing. It's been deployed about, officially legally deployed three or four times. Um, I assisted on the first couple deployments when I was with my last company. But video over Doxis is basically kind of like uh, VLC on crack. So it's a lot of multicast streams that you can tune into. And as, as one is requested, they just turn up another one, and it's available. And then your most common channels are always broadcast. Your less common channels are only broadcast on demand as needed. But if you have a constant stream, then everybody can tune into it when it's needed. And your channel change, your channel change time is less than um, less than a mi it's like half a microsecond or something like that. It's crazy. As soon as you hit that button, it's at the next channel. It's pretty cool technology. But with all technology, it does cost it costs money to play. If you want to play in the new world with the new technologies, you're going to have to invest a lot in infrastructure. It will pay off, but so I'm all over the place now on my second slide and haven't really moved forward. But let's see what else we got here. All right, this slide here, um, I'm sure you guys know how to read, so I'm not going to insult your intelligence. But basically, old school cable is unidirectional. We basically just send a frequency down to the home, usually straight RF the whole way. Eventually, we decided it would be smart to be bidirectional. I mean, how do I know if you bought that movie on uh, Spice Channel? you got to send something back to me to let me know you've made a purchase. So that's where pay-per-view comes in, and then eventually data docks us. So you can be bidirectional without fiber. You can go coax straight out. A lot of your, sm your smaller providers, they're not HFC or fiber, fiber coaxial. They don't go fiber, then coax. They actually go just coax the whole way. But you can only get so far in that cable before you lose signal. You can only amp it, amplify it so many times. That's the whole idea behind the fiber section. So as we move forward, we went to HFC plants. And as we went to HFC plants, we became bidirectional. And that allowed us to provide additional services, video on demand, <coughs> data services, and then voice over IP protocol. So data, voice, video, the whole bundle. And then some of your major providers now have teamed up with cellular providers 
and they're actually, actually offering, even offering cell phone services. So I've already covered this one for the most part, but your CMTS is your cable modem transmission system, it's basically a big old router. One half is layer three IP, the other half is RF layer one. So what does that mean? Well, the most common router in major deployments that I've dealt with would be a Cisco 10,012 series UVR router. It takes about a half a rack. It is capable of supporting 64,000 cable modems. That's a lot of cable modems. Well, that's what it's capable of, but not, not actually producing any real bandwidth at 64,000 devices. Um, your, honest, your honest load would be anywhere from 15 to 20,000 devices active with like 10 meg download speeds on the 10,000 series router. I'm sure you guys probably pay anywhere from 40 to 60 bucks a month for your data, fee, your data bill. Well, data is not regulated by the FCC as like video voice and some of the other stuff is. So there's not a lot of, ta it's actually kind of tax free. So their profit margin on data is huge. So as long as they have a pipe to the internet and they can get it to you, you shouldn't be paying, I don't, pretty much nobody pays taxes on data. It's not considered a utility yet. Once it becomes a utility, then a lot more stuff falls into place. And honestly, most of your, most of your service providers do not want to get into the net neutrality thing. They do not want to, they don't care what you're doing, honestly. They don't want to care. It costs them money to put crap in the middle to look at your stuff, and it's not cheap. So your ISPs aren't evil by design. The thing that makes them start to get evil is overutilization, which there's pros and cons to that. Nobody wants to hear the word cap, but you gotta understand there's only so much you can drink from the fountain before everybody else has got a drink. It is a shared service. Uh, most of the corporations I work with are cable companies. They don't want their plant more than 50% utilized. It's not good for them either. Their customer experience is important because a happy customer pays their bill on time. But then there also is some other things that kind of force them to get into the policing side of it, one being Kalia, where the federal government says, hey, by the way, if we need to wiretap somebody, you have to be able to do that. That's federal. Well, the, main, the vendors provide some of those resources built into the actual firmware, where with the court order, they can provide information that's requested. Um, some providers have gone a little bit further and tried to block certain protocols and they've been knocked down with the FCC knocked them down. So the new, the new trend right now is uh, what's called fair share. Because uh, Comcast ran into a little bit of issues when they were blocking certain protocols like BitTorrent. Some people got upset, peer to peer. Well with fair share, now it's protocol agnostic. So we're at peak hours and you're using too much data so I'm gonna slow everything down. You're still unlimited but you're not as fast as you were. But the vendors are pretty, they're, they're pretty smart about this. So what they did was they set up multiple ways to do this. Um, there's penalty box. That's where you're, if you, if it's during peak hours and you're doing 80% of your total line rate constantly for over a 10 minute period, then they'll cut you down to half of your line rate speed until peak hours reduce, until everybody else's claims, everybody else's request for bandwidth reduces. And then they just throw you back where you were and let you have all the bandwidth you want. Which is pretty cool. When you think about it, it's actually kind of cool. It's fair share. They're not stopping you from doing anything. They're not looking at what you're doing. They're just slowing you down so you have the same available bandwidth as everybody else might at the time. And then once everybody else gets offline, you're back to where you were. Full line rate that you paid for. Go ahead. So your question is, does the provider determine what prime time is right. like how and they, how is it different between providers? Right. Prime time is when the MRTG graphs go, oh crap, we're hurting. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Normally prime time is between 6 and 11 p.m. But there's a lot more entrepreneurial cable providers or MSOs that are now doing business class services because the businesses aren't usually running a lot of data between 6 and 11. They're running it between 8 and 5. Well, that's when there's nothing going on, and you know they got their pipe. 100 megs is 100, you know, 100 gig, 100 meg. It's, it's, it, 
that data is always there until it's utilized. So they found creative ways to sell to businesses during off-peak and then sell to residential customers during peak. So on a serious note, if you want to make a, a, a rather large distro download or something like that, do it after 11. It's not like you're going to sit there and watch the bits count. You have a better chance of getting the bandwidth you want off-peak. The biggest thing that's killing all ISPs, fiber, DSL, cable, everybody out there, is video on demand through external providers, i.e. Netflix. Go ahead. That would be the last bullet point right here. The frequency allocation. Do you notice the difference here? So for your downstream, you have between 88 and 1 gigahertz. 88 megahertz to 1,000 megahertz. It's kind of a wide spectrum there. But for your upstream, or what's called your return, from your house back to the cable company, is 5 to 85 megahertz. But 85 megahertz is DOCSIS 3 spec. Anything prior to DOCSIS 3 is actually 5 to 42 megahertz. Can anybody think of something that transmits between 5 and 42 megahertz? What do truck drivers talk on all the time? CB radio, 27 megahertz. What do amateur radios, radio operators use? Ham radio. Those also follow within that spectrum. Remote, remote control cars. You got two basic frequencies you get out of China, 27 and 49 megahertz. Well, the cable plant is technically sealed, but every time you put that cheap radio shack twist on connector on there, you add an antenna to the cable plant. So while Junior next door is playing with his remote control car, and your cheap Radio Shack twist on connectors close by, the transmitter for his remote control car is actually bleeding into the cable plant over the upstream. So even on that 5 to 42 usable megahertz on DOCSIS 2 and below deployments, there's a lot of places you can't really put a carrier to get reliable data transmission back. And between 5 and 12 megahertz, you have what's called earth noise. Um, you hook a spectrum analyze them up, and you look at some of the lower, the lower frequencies in the megahertz, there's always a carrier there. It's electrofields. That's also unusable. So you're really your usable frequency is kind of like 18 to 38 megahertz. And I actually get into your upstream channel widths, which equals raw bandwidth here in a second. But, yeah, your upstream is always sucked. It's really hard to troubleshoot that without knowing more information. Um, depending on where you're at, there could be an addition of a new, uh, a lot of new customers. Yeah. Um, some providers actually do put a quality of service on business connections. Most don't. The guy that showed up to your house in a bucket truck and told you that? No. Um, <laughs> the, usually the person you talk to on the phone is given a script and a little bit a little bit of freedom to kind of get into it. Yeah, I mean, depending on your market, because your band, you know, obviously, because the video recording may not catch your audio over there, you're complaining about your upstream speeds. They used to be three or four megs. Now they're less than a meg. Um, depending on your provider, and depending on where your provider's located and what their upgrade schedule is, um, do you have a DOCSIS 3.0 modem? That's just a manufacturer. Um, so... What you may want to talk to them is uh, verify that you are channel bonding, upstream channel bonding. So to say your DOCSIS 3.0 today means you're downstream channel bonding, but the DOCSIS 3.0 spec includes a lot more sexy things like IP version 6, advanced encryption, upstream bonding, downstream bonding. There's a lot more to it. So make sure that when you call them and you talk, to, ask to speak to an engineer, not a technician. 
Yeah, I mean, if you have a usually when you do a business services, and I got I got to admit, most of the companies are pretty good about it. You have a more skilled person to deal with, which is pretty cool because you're paying more. Um, it's always good to know what to ask them. Make sure that you're wideband online, W online, and make sure you ask them, that, are, am I upstream bonding? And if I'm not, why am I not? Have you not upgraded your plan? That's your speed. Okay. Yeah. Um, speed's irrelevant. You need to make sure that you're actually using multiple upstream carriers to bond traffic across because depending on the channel width of the carrier is the actual bandwidth. And somewhere in here we're going to get to that. Ah, vendors. So I kind of I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but I might as well run through this real quick. So there's Cisco Systems has the majority of market share. At one point in time it was 80%. Now it's probably about 75 60, 65, 75%. Um, Aris Corporation out of Atlanta, Israeli company. Um, they, were, they were pretty good CMTS market share now, but they probably had the best EMTA or VoIP modem on the market for a good amount of time. And that's where a majority of their sales came from, was actually modem sales or embedded EMTA devices. So if you're on the VoIP side, you know what ATA is? An ATA is basically a VoIP adapter. Well, it's built into the cable modem. Motorola. Well, I don't know if we should call Motorola or Google now, since Google bought them. But uh, they're number three. Hopefully Google will throw some money at them and let them uh, climb back up and try to get a little more market share. Because uh, prior to Google purchasing them, they didn't put a lot of uh, R&D into their products. And being vendor neutral, I used to work for one of those vendors up there on top. <clears throat> um, but prior to that, I worked in a lot of different cable companies, uh, some of the top threes. And I actually like the Motorola platform. The biggest problem I had with the Motorola platform was the code sucked. There was just a lot of bugs. The code's gotten better, but there's less people programming it. Hopefully with Google's acquisition, they can build themselves back up. And then the last guys, Costa Systems, they're kind of like the new kid in the block. So what happened was some really smart people from the above companies jumped ship and started this bottom company. And my best guess, which is only my opinion, was they all started this company to see if Juniper would buy them and jump in the game. Because Juniper had a, Juniper was in bed with Motorola for a short time and then pulled out and decided not to deploy a CMTS. This is a multi-billion dollar market. Everybody has a cable modem, just about. So the, it's a pretty big market, but it's a very niche market. Prior to my talk, you might have not even known what Doxus was. And trust me, there's very few Doxus engineers out there. Well, cost of systems, what they ended up doing was, as I explained earlier, there's something called Cable Labs. That's the certifying agent. Well, the top three vendors are only bronze certified Doxus 3.0. Cost of systems is gold certified. What that means is they went through a whole bunch of additional tests and spent a lot more money to get that quote unquote certification. But they are technically, to my knowledge right now to date, the only gold certified Doxus 3.0 solution meaning that they actually certified with Cable Labs in their lab in Colorado, downstream bonding, upstream bonding, uh, AES encryption versus DES, a much bigger key, which can change within seconds. Um, IP version six, multicast, all that good stuff. So cost is kind of interesting, and the only problem is they're not a major corporation, so their support model, supporting the major MSOs, is somewhat hampered because they don't have the money to hire as many support engineers. They're really big in Asian Europe right now, too. All right, so this slide is just basically going over modem. So as I kind of said, there's really only four vendors left on the CMTS side. And each one of those vendors, except for Casa, makes modems, too. Well, on the modem side, because a modem is not that hard to make, it's not a lot of silicone, and there's a lot of OEM producers in China, oh, my God, there's so many different modem vendors out there. Well, the problem with the modem vendors when you're a cable company is Docs suspects is you have to maintain the firmware on all the modems connected to your plant. This is why your cable company may or may not allow you to buy your own modem or may tell you which modem you can buy. Because according to Docs specification, it's up to them to maintain the firmware. Well, anytime something goes crappy, that firmware or something doesn't work or you upgrade the operating system of the CMTS and it causes a bug in the firmware and the modem, 
if they if the cable company you have today does not have a strong with that modem vendor it is becomes very difficult for them to get a patch to fix your device because it's their responsibility per docs specification to maintain your cable modem even though you own it by specification they have to maintain the firmware on that thing and keep it up to date it's more of a security pr protocol well if you start buying off brand modems and they let it on the plant and you have an issue you may have a hard time getting that issue fixed if it's actually a firmware issue with the modem. So your top modems, um, Motorola, Aris, Cisco's kind of come in and out of the market a few different times. Uh, since they acquired some Scientific Atlanta and rebranded it with the Cisco logo, there's more of those coming out. Um, I would trust any name you've heard before. But if you hear something like Huatsu or something off the wall, yeah, just don't bid on that on eBay. There's a good chance, one, your cable provider won't support it. Two, if they finally let it on, they're probably not going to be able to upgrade it as it needs because there's more features that may come out that won't be utilized on your modem, which may cause you problems. All right, cool. I think we're done with that one. Downstream. Okay, so we kind of talked a second ago about upstream on your question. Well, here's the downstream. I spoke about this a little bit earlier. But again, it's, it's bi-directional. So old school... The downstream, and in this question says it sits between 50 and 860. It's actually probably today more between 88 and 1 gigahertz. It can go higher because it is a sealed plant. But uh, anytime a squirrel chews into the cable on the pole, that causes what's called ingress or RF noise impairments, and that can cause just all kinds of gremlins in the system. Um, so most of your cable providers today are probably using a modulation scheme of 256 QAM which gives you, and I told you earlier, it gives you raw throughput of about 38 megabits, about 36.5 usable. And then uh, this, these last two things in the little, little bitty uh, box in the bottom are talking about your required and minimum CNR or carrier to noise. Also similarly referred to as SNR. There is a difference because CNR is talking about the log signal, SNR is talking about the frequency or the actual data, which is digital. But they're somewhat interchangeable in terminology, unless you're an RF guy. But those are basically talking about you need at least um, 35 decibel of clean signal. So if you've ever played with NetStumble or something like that, you notice like the dBs, that's decibel millivolts, and that's the power of the signal. And then your, your SNR, or signal to noise, is the crap that you can't understand below the signal to the top of the actual transmitter value, that's the signal you can use. And basically all you're doing is you're sending ones and zeros in frequency. Upstream, so now we get back to your question. So upstream, you have a lot of selections. So downstream, you're locked to either Annex A or Annex B. Annex A is Euro. Annex B is North America or most of the, most of the world. Annex B is 6 megahertz on the downstream. Annex A is 8. Now on the upstream, it's universal. So on the upstream, um, you have different channel widths and basically that's how wide or how wide of frequency are we going to use to send the signal and believe it or not it starts at 200 kilohertz and works its way all the way up to 6.4 megahertz um, you're not going to see 6.4 megahertz plants it's usually 3.2 wide reason being is 3.2 wide is accepted from doxis 1 to 30 if you turn it up to 6.4 only your doxis 2 and 30 will see that and all those customers with 1 1 and 1 0 modems they stop working They are because everything is backwards compatible, but you are correct. They are, most of your cable providers are trying to get rid of their 1011s. And the reason being is there's not very much spectrum in the upstream, 5 to 42 megahertz. There's not a lot of room there. And your higher modulations and your larger channel widths provide better throughput and more data throughput. But your slower devices, your older devices, cannot interpret that because they were, they were made before that came out. So you're only as fast as your slowest link. So... You could provide service to an area with 300 DOCSIS 3 modems and one 1 modem. Yeah. And as long as you've got to keep that 1 modem online, you can't do 6.4 wide megahertz, which means you can't take advantage of some of the better frequency throughputs. So on this, the, the bottom diagram where it explains the channel, so I only went up to 3.2. But if we were talking 6.4, 6.4 is 64 QAM is about 27 megabits per second per upstream channel. 
And with Doxa Trio, theoretically, you, you could bond either, anywhere from four to eight of those. So on the downstream, I told you, you had 36.5 times one to eight, depending on the amount of downstream channels. And on the upstream, I can give you 27 megabits per second times one to eight, or 16, or 24, however many. The modem is the weak part right now. The CMTSs can bond these channels left and right. It's the silicone vendors and the modem vendors Basically, well, there's only two. There's Texas Instrument and there's Broadcom. That's the only chipset vendors from the modem side. They actually produce the chipsets on the CMTS side, too. But that's the only RF chipset providers for the silicone, the raw silicone, that your Cisco, Aris, Motorola buy and then incorporate into their equipment. But you're basically your limiting factor today is the modems. So there, there are some 16 by 8 modems, meaning 16 downstreams by 8 upstreams. That's insane. You can have symmetrical connections, but you have less bandwidth on the bottom side. So if I build a cable system today, I could go 5 to 85 megahertz in the upstream versus the 42 cutoff. That gives me a lot more spectrum. And then on the downstream, I have 5 megahertz to, honestly, I could keep going. But we usually stop at 1 gigahertz. I could provide symmetrical services. And a lot of your cable providers are providing 5 meg symmetrical services to businesses. They are even providing T1 over DOCSIS and PRI over DOCSIS, where basically they put like a Cisco I out on one side for a, T, for a PRI, and then they convert the PRI into SIP, shoot it across to the DOCSIS network, and they convert it back from SIP to PRI. So it's basically a T1 media adapter. But I mean, if you call up your telephone company and ask them for a PRI, you're out minimum 600 bucks, if not $2,500 for a PRI. And that's only 1.5 mega, 1.54 megabits per second, but it's, old school PBX style data, voice data services. A lot of people still have that old Nortel, Avaya, whatever, you know, whatever PBX they have in their business, and it's only able to accept DS1s, DS0s, DS3s, which is old school transport voice carrier circuits. So what you're starting to see in the industry in general is a lot of your old school transport DS3, OC12, is now just going to Metro Ethernet. 10 megs, 100 megs, 1 gig, 5 gig, 10 gig, 100 gig. Yeah, I mean, you can have a symmetrical connection. Only download it one megabit per second, you'll probably get one up. It is possible to do a symmetrical connection, but understand that the bandwidth, RF bandwidth is not symmetrical availability. So this is just kind of explaining the, the, the DOCSIS protocol stack and how it relates to the OSI model. I don't know if we want to get that deep. So if you really want to get deep into the DOCSIS stuff later, because I'm probably running low on time, um, we, can, we can do that. You can find me afterwards, and we can really geek out and actually get into hex values. But let me see how much I have here. Yeah, so the upstream, the upstream modulation um, on a DOCSIS modem is either TDMA or uh, ATDMA. There is STDMA, but that wasn't supported until DOCSIS 2.0 and almost nobody jumped on board with that. With DOCSIS 3.0, it's also supported. The only real benefit of SCDMA modulation is that it has a better survivability rate on lower frequencies because of its, um, its ability to correct errors. Everything in a cable plant is encoded in MPEG-2. So even your DOCSIS package, your video package, everything is an MPEG 188 byte long frame. So we're gonna skip around here because I don't wanna kill you too much. There's the encapsulation. So we, we can go pretty deep here, but basically, how does the CMTS know that the carrier, because there's multiple car video carrier, everything's MPEG-2. So every carrier on your cable plan is a carrier. Well, there's actually a special header for DOCSIS that identifies it as DOCSIS. So when a modem is scanning the frequencies and increments, and it finds a carrier, it looks for the specialized MPEG-2 frame that says it's a DOCSIS carrier. 
And it says, okay, I better actually listen to this one. Because when it hits a video channel, it's like, um, this is garbage. It's a carrier, but it's not what I'm looking for. So I'll kind of explain how a modem comes online because that might help you out a little bit. So when you, when you turn your modem on, it's hooked up to the RG59 coax, or RG6 coax cable. Your modem immediately, once it finishes power cycling up and ramps up its, its, its actual converters, it starts scanning the downstream frequencies. If it's ever been online before, most modems have a last known good frequency where it knows to go back to to get on quickly. But if you've never used this device on your network before and you plug it in, it's going to start scanning. And depending on vendor, it may start at the bottom, it may start at the top, it may go in the middle, it may jump around to common carriers that thinks they're usable. But it's going to scan between the 88 up to possibly one gigahertz spectrum looking for carriers. Once it finds a carrier that has the DOCSIS frame header, then it listens a little bit longer to find out what's going on. Because right now, all I can do is listen. So I'm like listening to the radio. But I can't do anything. I can't really do two-way communications until I get a number to call them. Well, on the downstream, it's every so many microseconds is sending what's called a UCD or upstream channel descriptor. And it says, hey, if you're listening to this channel and you need to tune in, you can, re you can reach me, the CMTS, Big Daddy Bandwidth Manager, at this frequency, this frequency, this frequency, this modulation, this channel width. And the modem says, hey, I need to do that. So it tunes, it gets its upstream tuners ready to go. But now it has to wait for something's called a registration request period. So what happens on the downstream is there's constantly data coming down to the modems, all the modems in the node. At the same time, there's certain allocated time slots for registration requests. And there could be a lot of modems trying to come at once. And what basically what happens is they all have random number generators. And it says between time, po time point one and time point 81, you can request bandwidth or you can request registration. And the modems use their random number generator to pick one of those numbers within that range. And that's when they transmit. If two transmit at the same time because their generators happen to be on the same frequency, which is one in a large number, that, that will happen. Then the CMTS hears noise and it doesn't respond. And the modem just assumes that it had a collision and it backs off and changes its random number. When it successfully happens, it says, I'm here, this is me, I want to talk. If it already has been registered, then it's actually requesting bandwidth to speak. At that point, the CMTS sends another thing down and it basically grants data. It basically gives time in the line. And this is a con this window is constantly spinning around. You gotta think this if you slowed this down, you'd still have a hard time keeping up with it. But basically what happens is a modem locks in a downstream, it gets its UCD or upstream channel descriptor, finds the upstream. It waits for registration requests. It says, hey, I'm here, and it waits. If it gets no response, no response back, either it assumes it, it talked over somebody or it assumes it's not talking loud enough. So it speaks a little bit louder, knocks up its tuner a few more dB, tries it again once it has a chance to speak, and it waits. It gets a response, moves on. If it doesn't, it turns up its tuner a little bit higher. A little more band, you know, a little more amps. So say it goes from 20 dB to 30 dB. When the CMTS finally responds and says, hey, I can hear you, by the way, stop screaming at me. Tune your, tune your, you tune your radio down 7 dB, you're screaming. Because the CMTS wants to have the modem return back to him at 0 dB. You're like, oh, that's not a number. Well, in, in decibels, your, your acceptable receive level is actually between negative 15 and positive 15. Just like optical light, your optical light levels can actually be negative numbers and still be transmitting optical light. Once it receives data and it negotiates its registration request and its ranging, where it works out all its proper RF tweaks with the CMTS, then it can say, oh, by the way, am I legal to actually use your network? That's when it goes back to the MAC address, takes the MAC address, the serial number, and the certificate from the modem, and says, okay, let me check to see if you're legal. If it does, then what it would end up doing is it would issue them a bin file which, which controls the speed levels the modem is able to do and any other restrictions. And then on top of that, then it can start participating in DHCP, issuing out the IP addresses. Um, DOCSIS Rio supports IP version 6. So if you're a DOCSIS Rio modem and you have an IP version 6 compatible PC or CPE behind the device, not XP, Windows 7 or Mac or Linux. Yes, but it doesn't support all the multicast and it doesn't really work. It's half baked. That's another problem that the internet's gonna have to deal with soon with uh, 
trying to move to IP version six is the CPE is not ready. It's the core is something that the providers can manage. They can upgrade the core. They, I don't think your cable company's going to come out there and say, um, yeah, we, we got to give you a new version of Microsoft because you suck. They're just not going to want to get that involved with you. And we are out of IP version four addresses. The providers that have some are keeping them, but it's going to be hard to get to version six because of the customer end complexities. The biggest thing the cable industry is most likely going to do is they're going to put an all-in-one gateway, a modem, that acts as like a Linksys router kind of thing, you know, but it's going to do the transversion. So it's going to spit out the 192 on this side, but it's all IP6 on the other side. So it's going to do the translation for you. I know you guys are hungry, so I'm going to try to move a little bit quicker. This is cover more of the packet frames. Okay, Mac management messages. So, when a modem comes online or has any kind of Mac message, so think of layer two ish, layer one, layer two ish. I told you before when it ranged, well, you got a sync, upstream channel descriptor, a map, which explains frequencies and where they go, range request, range response, registration request, registration response, upstream channel change request, upstream channel change response. I'm not sure what try TVC is, but there's a lot of different kinds of messaging that happens on the DOCSIS layer. So DOCSIS 1.0 messages, first column. Second column, additional messages in DOCSIS 1.1. DOCSIS 2.0, a few additional. And unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to upgrade this DOCSIS 3.0. DOCSIS 3.0 adds a whole new book to the picture because now we're not just talking about V4, we're talking about V6 too. And we're also talking about advanced uh, multicast, unicast, anycast. And um, the current security features and encryption in DOCSIS um, 1.0 to 2.0 being baseline privacy interface, or BPI, and then BPI plus with the X509 certificate. Well, DOCSIS 3.0, we're actually supporting AES encryption. So we got away from the old school DES keys, which were pretty much uncrackable because we could change it. We could set the interval to rekey. And if I change that thing to like 30 minutes, I don't, I don't care what kind of GPU crackers you have. You're not breaking DES in 30 minutes. Well, with AES, it gets even worse. So it was the response to the cable companies wanting to protect your personal data. They really honestly don't want to look at your stuff. They don't really care. They don't want to care. RIAA, federal government, they want them to care. Their job is basically, we just want to give you a service and get our money. And if we can give you any other bells and whistles, they're already included, why not? So the more government gets involved, and people, a lot of people are like net neutrality. Honestly, once you get the federal government involved in the internet, I don't see anything good coming out of it. Personally, I mean, that, that's, that's my opinion. Because anytime they've regulated anything, they've kind of went a little too far. If you don't like your, your provider, cable DSR, whatever, and you think they're eavesdropping on your stuff, switch providers. I mean, there's not a place in the US you can't even get a satellite provider. You have options. You may not like your options, you may not be able to afford all of your options, but you have options. You can go through a proxy server, you could use encryption. If you're really worried about people looking at your stuff, encrypt it. But forcing your providers to get involved with stuff like net neutrality, that's just asking the federal government to get involved with the internet. And nothing good, in my opinion, will come out of that. Once you start regulating things, then you find new ways to make taxes on them and new ways to change things. If you start getting taxed per protocol, it's going to get messy. If everybody encrypts, then the government can't see what's going on and they're going to get upset. So let's just keep it the Wild West and try to keep our systems up the best we can and educate the people we know on how to keep themselves safe. That's a whole different rant, so sorry I broke away there for a second. Let's see what else we got here. This is more of uh, explaining the messaging. So maps, I kind of went over this a little bit, but basically your maps are basically, they're, they're being transmitted all the time. And um, they basically have mini slot, uh, they provide mini slot information and this stuff. Mini slots basically time ticks. Or best way to explain a mini slot, on the upstream talking back, so you want to transmit data back to the internet, you only have so many slithers of time you can transmit that data in. And um, once you get to higher throughputs, you, you start sacrificing things. 
So it's either megabits per second or packets per second. Which one do you like? If it's packets per second, then it's going to be lots of small packets. VoIP loves packets per second. High-speed download likes megabits per second. So your service provider's got to kind of find that happy medium where I can provide a lot of packets per second and still provide a decent amount of megabits per second. Because if I optimize it for packets per second, your maximum upstream throughput per device is probably about two megs. That's not going to make a lot of people happy. So I got to find that happy medium where I can get you 10 megs up per, per upstream, but still provide you a quality of service and low latency. Because if I do megabits per second, your latency increases because now your small packets, I have to pad a lot of crap in there to send that packet off because it's a large packet. I can do packet header suppression. I can do um, concatenation where I can stack a whole bunch of smaller packets in one big box. But voice is real time. It doesn't want to wait for that stuff. Okay, Doxus 3.0, we'll jump into this one because I think I'm almost out of slides. Yay. So what do we get with Doxus 3.0? We get IP version 6 support. We get bonding of RF channels. So I kind of explained that earlier. Basically, old school, you had one up, one down, RF channel. Now you can have multiple ups and multiple downs. So we're basically striping data across the different RF channels to give you one big pipe. How do we do that? Well, we actually sequence the packets so we can reassemble them. And it happens really fast. AES encryption. That's good. Let's keep your data safe. Let's not make sure that your uh, script kitty neighbor can't sniff your packets. Increased security. So the security besides the AES, there's other security. Early authentication so you can't see registration. Um, faster speeds. That goes back to the bonding. Better bandwidth utilization. So that may not make a lot to the end consumer, but to the provider, they have so many downstream frequency channels. They don't want channel 8 being at 80% and channel 3 being at 20%. So with the Doxus 3.0 modem, because it, the tuners can lock onto multiple downstreams, even if the service they're offering that customer is 4 megs and they're locked across 4 downstream channels, which could give them like a lot more than that, <laughs> they're able to equally utilize that bandwidth across the devices. So everybody gets a little bit of it. So you might have a device that can do 50 and a device that can do five locked on the same set of downstreams. But instead of having that one, that device that does five just locked in a single downstream, then you have to move them as bandwidth moves around, which is called load balancing, where you actually tell the device to go over to this frequency because this one's clogged. Now you're on all the frequencies. It's a lot better on utilization and it helps you better utilize your bandwidth across the RF spectrum, which in return provides better services for the end customer. And then there's more services coming to cable system here. That basically refers to more of the video over Doxis and the more advanced IP features. Just think of, if I had a big pipe to the internet, what couldn't I do? And that's kind of the idea behind some of the newer stuff. And then the next thing after Doxis 3.0 is probably gonna be uh, RFOG or RF over glass. So as I explained earlier with HFC hybrid co coaxial fiber network, basically I transmit fiber down to the neighbor and then convert it to RF. Well, now I'm actually just going to send the, send the glass somewhere to the pond all the way down to your house and then convert it to RF at your house. At that point, I give you a lot of spectrum. Five minutes. I'm pretty much done, so. Questions? Um, our fog is probably a little more advanced for five minutes. You can find me outside and I can talk more about that and explain to you um, the standards behind it. But basically, in, the easiest way to explain it is very similar to PON. So passive optic networking, except instead of the end unit just being um, Ethernet, I'm actually transmitting a whole cable plant at the edge of your house. Um, no, I will not help you hack your cable modem or steal service from a service provider. That's theft, sorry. Uh, references, the information in this PowerPoint as contained information provided through the websites of Cisco Cable Labs, Google, Motorola, Aris, and Wikipedia, not to mention myself. So, short time back, a hacker halted. Um, Brad, or the nurse, suffered from a stroke. These links, I got, I stole them from Iron Geek, because, uh, but 
try to help out if you can. He's in uh, ICU and down in Miami. And uh, he can use your prayers, financial, whatever you can afford to give, even if it's just moral support. But uh, a member of our community is in dire need of help. Any more questions? Thank you.